lovely to be back in the house of the Lord with you all. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand up. Amen. This is on then. Praise you, Jesus. Welcome. We have the sisters here this morning. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming to worship with us here this morning. Father, we worship you and we exalt you. You are holy and you are worthy of all our praise. And Father, today we just make, Lord, that uh, we choose today, Father God, that we will lay everything down to you, Lord. And Father, thank you for your people this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you have brought us together to worship you, Lord, in the con congregation of the saints. In Jesus' name, amen. Everything to you. Sing together. With this heart open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will breathe as sacrifice. With this hands lifted high, hear my song. life and let it shine amen oh take this life and let it shine i lay me down i lay me down i'm not my own i belong to you alone lay me down is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me down. Let's sing it, let it go, let it go of my pride. Giving up all my rights to this life and let it shine. Oh, take this life, take this life and let it shine. no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us, Lord, even your word clearly say, for those who submit themselves to God, you will lift them up. Father, that's a prayer of our heart, Lord, that every day our lives, Lord, is laying down to you and that lord that we will follow your perfect will according to your word in jesus name amen <coughs> let's just sing the amazing grace of god this morning never cease to amaze me and i'm sure to amaze you the amazing grace of god and let's sing it together was 
can stand for your grace alone and that knowing Lord that you have taken our chains away the burden of sin the burden Lord that comes into our lives from time to time and father thank you that you are a chain breaker and for that we're so grateful and we're so thankful this morning and above all Lord we want to thank you for the father's love for the Father's love into our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing the song together. Father's love.
for the blood this morning, Lord. We're always remember what you've done on the cross 2,000 years ago. And it's still 
very alive in our hearts because you rose from the dead. Not only that you died for our sins, but you rose from the dead to ransom us and to give us eternal life, oh God. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The bridge was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you had me in your side. So you made a way. Everybody say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, he has washed me white. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life and brought me from Glory to His name. There to my 
song because he lives I can face tomorrow father thank you only because you rose from the dead and you give us hope not just hope but you give us future and so therefore we can truly say from our heart of God because he lives just the chorus we just sing it together church just to close in our worship secure in your hands father thank you so much lord not only lord that it's some people would say oh you're just you know like believing and dreaming of this things that doesn't exist oh he, he does exist because he exists not just because written in the word of god but it's because we know it in our hearts that he lives in us Emmanuel God dwells in us and father thank you you are here you are here and you are our future our future is secure there's nothing to worry about there's nothing to fear about because we are in your hands in Jesus name 
You may be seated, church, and let's continue in the atmosphere of just worship this morning as we prepare ourselves to take the Lord's communion. Amen. So it's a uh, very good morning, church. It is, I was thinking there, you know, the psalmist said, it was good for me to go to the house of the Lord, you know, to enter his courts, to be among his people. You know, it says in Psalm 73, he said, my foot almost slipped. He said, when I considered the prosperity of the wicked. That's David writing, you know, when he, when he looked at the world around him. And he was thinking about it all. He was saying, you know, why am I keeping myself pure? Why am I going up to the house of God? Why am I walking with the Lord? And he was looking around at the prosperity of things. And then he said, when I did go to the house of the Lord, he said, you know, it started to begin to make sense. He said, you put their feet on a slippery place. It is always good for us to come into the house of the Lord. It is here that we get the right perspective of life and the future, as you say, and everything else that goes with that. So if you're here today for the first time, you are very welcome. I know there's Victor here from Northern Ireland, is one of our visitors. Uh, this gentleman here, I didn't get to speak to you, but I think you're here with your family, and you are very welcome. And if there's anyone I've missed, just to say you're very welcome here today to Living Rock Church in, in Killarney. And just to announce as well that during the week, we have our usual Bible study on uh, Wednesday, which is the Gospel of John. I think we're moving through uh, John 3, 4. We're into John 4. So we're heading to the woman at the well, the thirsty woman who brought her jar. And of course, uh, we'll arrive there at some stage, uh, probably ne uh, next Wednesday or this Wednesday. And then we have systematic theology. We are probably just leaving the Trinity, although last uh, Thursday on Zoom, it was quite interesting and it got very deep. Uh, you know, some things about theology can be too deep for some people and it can be just right for others. But you know, God puts us on a journey in our learning and he takes us where we're at. And of course, this has been a very challenging uh, study in many aspects. And again, we were reminded that, you know, whatever your theology is, you know, it is of faith. We believe and trust what God has said. Even if we don't understand everything God has shown us in his word, we have enough to believe and receive. We have enough to believe and receive salvation. And we have enough to walk with him in righteousness. Because he has, as I heard mentioned at this, in the study, he has given us everything uh, in Christ for godliness. And we are such a blessed people. So we don't have to know it all. But uh, it's good to learn. It's good to study um, in, in these matters. So we are going to come uh, very soon to the breaking of bread. Um, I will be bringing uh, the message on that. Uh, but before I do, we have our very own Conan uh, Darrell, who's going to read from um, Exodus 12. And uh, I'll let you add a Conan. If you want the lights, do you want the lights up here? No, I should. You okay? Well, it should be, I can see. Fine. Yeah. So, Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for the household, and if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his near, nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. 
when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. A statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. For seven days you shall eat the unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove the leaven from your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Isn't that? 16 and 16 on on the on the first day you shall hold a holy assembly and on the seventh day a holy assembly no work shall be done on those days but what everyone needs to eat that alone may be prepared by you amen amen thanks corner great stuff yeah so um Thank you for that. Let's just pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you, God, that you have called us to this place, Lord, to remember your death, Lord, your passing and your, your resurrection, Lord, these ordinances that you've given us, Lord. Let us help us reflect, Lord, on what you are saying in your word here, Lord. And just give me strength, Lord, just to um, open up this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what we see here really is the organization of the Passover, where Jesus, or where God had taken his people out of Egypt. And as Conan read, they put the blood on the lintels of the door. And when the death angel passed over their house, it was a sign, as you read it there, it says, it's a sign to you and to me that I will pass over. It's a sign. And many, many of you got up this morning, and as you maybe traveled to church, maybe you looked for signs, signs on the road. Maybe you had to find your way here. Maybe you're a visitor. You looked for signs how to get here. Maybe use Google Maps. You know, but God is a God who gives us signs. Signs in the way to go. Jesus said, I am the way is a sign. So what is a sign? A sign is a message of description, a help in how we are or where we are to go. And some signs could be a, a danger sign. You know, God in Genesis, I won't go there in Genesis 6, he put a sign in the rainbow, it was a sign from God to man. He said, I will put my rainbow in the sky. And so that when I look on it, I will remember. And I will, with my covenant, I will never flood the earth again. Now, God didn't put that really there, I believe, because God forgets. I really do believe God put it there. So that when we see the rainbow, we see we have a covenant God. He has given us a sign. Those of us that know the scriptures and believe the scriptures have that understanding. And that was given right there in Genesis 6. 
after the flood, or before, uh, sorry, Genesis 8 after the flood. And again, we see that when Abraham was called, he was given a sign. When he was told, look at the stars of the heaven, he said, your descendants will be like this. And God there cut a covenant with Abraham and made a sign with him. And later on again, we see that, you know, um, in this covenant with Moses, there was another covenant. And God gave the circ circumcision, which was an outward sign for all the firstborn males, so that when they would look at their flesh, they would see there was a cutting of covenant, that God had given them a sign in their flesh that he is a covenant God, and he's a God that keeps his promises. So when we look in scripture, we do see that God gives signs, and yet there are people in the scriptures that have asked God for a sign. Gideon asked God for a sign that God would be faithful and would deliver the, the, the Philistines, maybe it's the Midianites, into his hands, and he put out a fleece. And God honored that because God saw his heart and it, he put it out twice. He was unsure, but God gave him a sign that sure enough, God would keep his promise. And there are lists of signs right through the scriptures. And of course, as we enter the new covenant, we know that Jesus done many signs and wonders. And John tells us that all of those signs and wonders is that we would believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And of course, right here in Exodus, God says that the blood is a sign. And as we enter into the new covenant, we see the ordinances again, that Jesus, Jesus keeps the ordinances of the old covenant here in Exodus 12. He keeps the first day of unleavened bread, he goes to begin to keep the Passover. The Jews had kept it as an ordinance for generations and generations, just as they were commanded. But that ordinance was coming to an end. He was beginning to start with a new ordinance, a new sign, a sign of remembrance. Many people say, oh, we, we, we keep the Lord's Supper, but sometimes we look in the scriptures, but why do we have to keep it maybe every month or as Jesus said, as often as you keep it, but it is a reminder and it is a sign that we are in covenant with God and he is faithful. And as we look back in time at the covenants that God has given his people and we look at the signs that he gave them to remember, give them remembrance of those covenants, we can be assured as we today, as it were, take the emblems of this covenant, the new covenant, that again, God is giving us the sign written in covenant blood of our Savior. Just quickly, you might have a picture of five of the covenants that God had made. It's just literally just for to show us there is the Noahic covenant where he made with Noah in Genesis 8. There's the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant with Moses and the people. He made a covenant with David, which Jesus uh, fulfilled partially and will fulfill in the future. And of course, today we are in the new covenant. Now, some of these covenants slightly overlap, like the Abrahamic covenant is still being fulfilled in those that come to Christ, because he said, I will bless all the nations through your descendant. And that descendant was Jesus. So, as I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I read here the Apostle Paul's words to the church. Remember, an apostle who was faithful as he saw in the old covenant, zealous for the law, zealous for the law of Moses, zealous for the things of God, and now Paul has entered the new covenant. And the ordinances that God has given the New Testament church, both Jew and Gentile, are now before us. We are now in covenant relationship with God. I was reminded there when Conan was reading in through that first, uh, as it were, offer of ordination, uh, ordinances to the 
covenant, the Mosaic covenant in Exodus 12, he said there, you're to do no work for seven days. You're to rest. They were to reflect, put the leaven out of their houses, which was a symbol of sin. They were to remember the blood and the Passover and that the death penalty was taken from, from them. They did not receive the judgments that the nation of Egypt did. He said, seven days you were to rest. And I think of Jesus on the cross in the new covenant and he said, it is finished. There's no more work that we can add to the finished work of Calvary. It is done. We are to rest in the new covenant, in the finished work of Christ. Michael earlier gave me a receipt for something that he picked up for me. That was the receipt. It was a sign to me that he paid for it. And in the New Testament, God says that the Holy Spirit is a seal, as it were, is a sign that you have received Christ in the new covenant. In fact, Paul goes on in Romans 8 to say that anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That's how significant the seal and the sign of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. So with that, we will hear the words of the Apostle Paul. For he says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took at, at supper, after supper, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the, of the Lord. So a man or a woman ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats of the, and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment to himself. And this is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. May the Lord bless his word. You know, just I'm going to give some time to reflect. Let the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit brings anything in your heart, you want to commune with him and confess anything before you come and take of the sign of this covenant, the elements of the covenant. This ordinance will be with us till Jesus returns. The ordinances of Exodus 12 finished at this first meal. You know, like the high priest used to go in once a year, not just for the sins of the people, but for his own sins. I, hear, I standing up here, am just like you. I have to reflect on my sin because there was only one perfect one ever, and that was Jesus. There was only one that could give us perfect righteousness, and that was Christ. And we're all on the same in the same place. I've heard it once said, the ground is level at the cross. The ground is level at the cross. So let us just uh, give some time um, to reflect and thank the Lord. Lord, as we just, Lord, as we 
before we come up, Lord, to take of the cup and take of the bread, Lord. We just want to give you thanks this morning for your righteousness. We want to thank you, Lord, that you paid it all for us, that the work is finished. We thank you, God, that you have given your spirit to us as a seal, a guarantee of our inheritance. We thank you this morning that you called us out of the world, Lord, and you made us your people. And just like Israel was called out of Egypt and they kept the ordinance of the Passover and of the unleavened bread, Lord, we thank you this morning that you called us out to keep this ordinance of the supper, Lord, of the lamb, Lord. So, Lord, we just ask you to bless us now as we obey this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you come forward in your own time and you take cup and you take the bread, uh, if you go back to your seat, um, we will finish this ordinance. Amen. Great to see everybody. We haven't been in church for weeks. Uh, obviously, it's good to be back among God's people. And if, there's, if you haven't been here for a while, good to see you once again. Um, and if there's visitors here, Good to see you as well. People from all over the country and uh, even abroad are here. Um, that was good as well. That um, it reminds me of the wedding at Cana where Jesus' mother said they have ran out of wine. And we don't often have um, a shortage of the cups, so hopefully uh, that's a good sign. But let's pray for the offering. Lord, not only uh, do we give on to you, Lord God, but we also lift it up to you and say, Lord God, see these offerings as they reflect the prosperity of your people, Lord God, or where we're at physically or financially, Lord God, that you would meet every need that is represented here. Because people may have given out of their need or out of their want, saying, Lord, this could be... Um, D difficult for me this coming week. I've got bills to pay. I have things to do. Lord God, would you meet every need? And also, Lord God, as we give these, we give them unto the Lord and we set them aside as unto the Lord for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the work of the Lord and the support of your people, Lord God. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Oops. <laughs> that, that was from the setup from last night. Don't worry, it was me. All right. So we haven't got an awful lot of time, but I know you, you, you don't mind um, when, it, when sometimes long messages, do you? This, this may look like an awful lot, four pages, but actually what happened was I made the print massive because I wasn't able to see it before. Might as well just, why not just print it bigger? You know, then, then you don't have to use the glasses as much, right? I was trying to squeeze it all on the two, a, a double-sided page before, and I said, why should I do that? Might as well enlarge it. Amen. So we're going to pray again. Lord God, you would speak to us through your word. If we've got ears to hear, Lord God, you're going to speak to us. You're going to minister to our hearts and we receive this word in Jesus' name. Amen. So that Jesus will receive all the honor and all the glory. Amen. Amen. As you know, we are doing some psalms in the summertime because we have visitors and also because it's good to go through the psalms. They are the, what Luther called the little Bible. Why did he call it the little Bible? It's because there's so much in it that you'd say, wow, that's just, this is in the, the New Testament. It's quoted so many times. The themes are there as well, all throughout the New Testament. And Jesus did say, did he not, you'll read of me in the psalms and in the books of Moses and in the law, so and the prophets. So there's bound to be stuff here, and we have to look out for it. You have to be have a watchful eye. So we're in Psalm 35, and the title in your Bible may be different from mine, but this one says, "Great is the Lord," and it just says of David, which means, of course, that David was the one who penned it. And we're going to run through this quite quickly. There are a lot of verses. So it's like a train is leaving the station. Are you on board? Okay. We may not stop at every station, and we may not spend a lot of time at each station uh, or each stopping point, but we're going to just run through and see what the Lord says. Okay. So first of all, in verses 1 to 3, he says, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. 
draw the spear and javelin, javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. What's going on there? The language is something of someone maybe in a battle situation, but battles can also take place like when you're in court and you think someone has to help me out here. I need strong people to come to my defense. And this, it seems like there are people who are chasing after David, who are trying to bring him to court, and they're accusing him, and they're making false accusations, and he says, I need someone to rise up and help me here. And so that's what he says here. Um, he's, I'm feeling accused. I'm feeling like I'm being pursued, and there's people chasing me down. And um, when it says contend for me, it literally means make a legal case on my behalf because I need someone who can really fight for me here. Who's going to do the fighting for us? Well, in David's case, he says, the Lord's going to do it for me. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you would do that. Grab your spear, grab your javelin, grab your shield, grab your buckler, and go into battle for me. And there's a lovely line just at the end of that uh, first uh, three verses there. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. You know, there are people who would love to hear a word from God. They said, if I could hear that, I mean, how many would like to know for sure that you're saved? You want to know. I want to hear it in my soul. I am your salvation. Would that encourage you to know that God spoke to you and said, I am your salvation? Some people are saying, but I never, I never had that kind of an experience where I would hear from God. Well, there's one way you could hear it. You could read it, <laughs> and you could read it out loud. You could say, okay, I'm going to read that, and I'm going to read it over and over again until it hits me. Sometimes you've got to do that. You've got to say, hold on a second. If David could have the Lord speaking to his soul, I want to have that kind of same assurance to know that I'm saved, that I can say, the Lord has spoken to my soul, and I, I know that he is my salvation. Has anyone experienced that here? Maybe you said, no, I didn't hear any audible voices, but I heard the word when it was preached. And when I heard that, I said, that's for me. I, I, I received that. It just went off like an, a, an alarm in you and said, yes, the Lord is my salvation. Okay, let's continue on. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. This is a bit more of the picture we're getting here. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. I think Eddie mentioned that a little earlier as well. So what's he saying? I'm being chased. I'm being hunted down. I feel like they're on, hot on my heels trying to get at me, my enemies. Have you ever felt that there's an enemy out to get you? Maybe a physical enemy, a person, someone who's attacking you non-stop continually. I've been through that. I've had a, a, a bit of that experience. I think, what on earth is going on here? Um, but it says here that let them experience the shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let that come back on them. And it's not saying I pray bad things on them. You're just saying let the Lord deal with them, people. Amen? Let them be turned back and disappointed. They are the ones who experience that. Who devise evil against me. Other people who actually have, who sit down and calculate and say, I'm devising a plan, evil against you. There may be. But even if you can't relate to that in an actual scenario, you can't, no, I can't say I've experienced that. You know that as a saint of God, you have an enemy, don't you? And what does the enemy do? He comes as in Revelation chapter 12, verses 17 to 19. Does it not say something about that? It says, I think we have it on the screen, Revelation 12, because it would just save me having to look it up. But it says we have an enemy who is the accuser of the brethren. Does it not? You find it? Revelation 12, verses 7 to 10? No, Revelation 12, verse 10. I'll do. And there are, yeah, there you go. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them night and day before our God. We have an enemy who does that, of course. Okay? 
Now, the idea of the enemy being pursued, that should remind you perhaps of Psalm 1. There are two paths in life, okay? And in the Psalms, all the way through the Psalms, there are two paths, the path of the righteous and the path of the wicked. And the path of the righteous is blessed. How many of you can say, yeah, thank God I'm on that right path, that I'm blessed. But the path of the wicked, well, you can hold your place in Psalm 35, and you can go to Psalm chapter 1. Um, where it says in verse 4, The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. They're blown all over the place. uh, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. That is what is determined for the wicked. They will perish. Okay? And then not just that, but imagine being driven by the wind, constantly knocked all over the place. And even worse than that, as it says in Psalm 35, let me just go back there. It says here, let their way be dark and slippery. They tell you how bad life is. It's, it's terrible. It's dark. It's, I'm, I'm slipping all over the place. And even worse than that, you've got the angel of the Lord driving them on. He's like... But right behind them, making it really difficult for them. They think, why would did they experience this? Well, it's because of the wickedness and the path that they're on. And because of what they have planned against God's people, there's going to be something that's going to come back on them. Okay? So David's not saying, I just want to see bad things happen. He's saying, let them experience what is due to them. Amen? The, the angel of the Lord may even be the Lord himself, as you well know. Okay, so verses 7 to 8 says this, For, you can underline this, without cause. For without cause, they hid their net for me. Without cause. And this is a phrase you will see repeated, not only here, but also later on in the, in the chapter. Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon them, upon him, when he does not know it. And the net that he hid in, uh, he hid and snare him. Let him fall into it uh, to his destruction. There you go. The whole idea is there wasn't any reason for what they're doing without cause. And you know, if you do, th- if you sense that there is maybe a cause, the enemy's attacking me. But maybe there's some reason. Maybe there's something I've done in my life. Ever had that thought come to you? Well, Psalm 66. Verse 18 says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If you feel like, well, I can't be absolutely confident because there are things in my life that are not quite right, then you need to deal with that so that there is no cause, so that the enemy can't point the finger at you. Don't let him have any foothold or any reason to point the finger at you. And that's what David says, for without cause they have done all this. And um, he's just praying. Um, And you know what? The enemy lays traps. Living the Christian life is not easy, is it? It's like walking through a minefield. And there's triggers, there's traps. You could fall into all kinds of things laid out by the enemy. And I have to be led by the Spirit and guided that I would avoid those pitfalls. So he says, let them fall into their own traps. And you know the enemy... Uh, when, they, when it says here, let them fall into their own pit or into their own um, grave, it's basically talking about the grave and the destruction. They want to see destruction of God's people. They want to see your destruction. The enemy of our souls, Satan, as we know, wants to see your destruction. Okay, But let me ask you this. What is his final end? Do you know where he's going? Again, Revelation chapter 20 You may be able to just quickly go there. It says, and when the 10,000 years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the land of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, which the, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. If the devil reminds you of your past, what do you do? 
Remind him of his future. He don't like to be reminded of that fact, okay? So we know the enemy might have things planned for you, but you know you can avoid his pitfalls, okay? Now go back to Psalm 35. After praying this, he says this, Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exalting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. See, after seeing the deliverance, but he hasn't experienced it yet. Isn't it faith speaking when you say, I already see my outcome. I already see what the Lord's going to do. I've prayed that this will happen, but I'm already planning on rejoicing. Isn't that the, the person of faith that says, well, and then this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to rejoice, exalting in the salvation. And when it says, all my bones shall say, I think we could trans, uh, paraphrase that and say, every, with every fiber of my being. Isn't that what we do? What happens when you worship God? Do you say, I give it, I worship God with all of my heart? And all of my soul, or do you give it a little bit of a... Eh. I mean, we need to be, be doing it with every fiber of our being. Let all your bones cry out, amen? And say, that my, my, all my bones shall say, oh Lord, who is like you delivering the poor from him? You know, the poor people in those days wouldn't have had a, a leg to stand on when the enemy, who happened to be a rich person, uh, an oppressive rich person, would take them to court, and they're going to take you for everything you've got. And they want someone, who's going to stand up for me? Who's going to rescue me? Who's going to be my knight in shining armor? Who's going to come in and rescue me? Well, it's going to be like this for David. He says, I see the Lord is going to do that for me. And I will rejoice when it happens. Amen? Now listen to verses 11 to 14. He says this, malicious witnesses. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay E they repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. So when I first re read these verses, of course, I thought of Jesus at the crucifixion, and how there were false witnesses, even at his judgment when he was brought into on trial. Uh, there were many people who came against him. There were false witnesses who said this and that about Jesus, did they not? And of course, Jesus fulfills this Psalm 100%. So David is only speaking about his experience, but of course, it's greater. It, there's, a, there's a greater fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But we can maybe um, say that, Sometimes there's that sort of thing that's going to happen in our lives. When there's somebody who's speaking bad things about you, malicious witnesses, and he says, and I don't even know anything what they're talking about. They're talking about, they're, they're saying nasty things about me, and I don't even know where are they getting it from. I don't know. It'd be different if there was any truth to it, but there's not even a shred of truth. And he says it as though he knows these people. Because he says, but I, when they were going through their sickness, isn't that what he says here? He says, but I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. That's got to be someone you know. I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. And, and guess what? I prayed with head bowed on my chest. And I went about as though I grieved for my friend or for a brother. That's a very close relationship. So I mean, my attitude is not what their attitude is. Just because they're nasty to me, and I'll tell you what, when it was them who were going through it, I wasn't like that. I was really praying for them and even fasting for them. That's the attitude of the true person of God, isn't it? Now, on the other hand, uh, what does it say in verses 15 to 16? This is a strange reaction. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced. And gathered together against me, wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. Does this remind you of anything? I mean, certainly it should remind you of Psalm 22 and uh, the things that it talks about there, uh, about Jesus at the cross. But, you know, the idea of the other people he says he knows, the ones he prayed for, but these ones, he says, but at my 
stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered together against me wretches whom I did not know. Well, that's a different thing. How many of you were once a wretch? We sang it in the song earlier on. I was a wretch. Yeah, not a wrench or a wench, <laughs> but a wretch, wretched person that I was. Okay, I can't. And, and there's that song. I hear, I, I hear my mocking voice cry out amongst the mockers. We were all like that. But here's a, here he's saying these people took delight in my downfall or at my stumbling or the troubles I was going through. They're, they're not very nice people, are they at all? And the other person, I thought it would apply directly to Jesus. I actually looked up verses where it says they gnashed at him with their teeth concerning Jesus. I couldn't find any. I'm sure there are some, but I do know one against whom they gnashed their teeth. And uh, that was in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, where Stephen was being brought before the uh, people who were throwing stones at him. They, they were taking his life. And it says they gnashed at him, gnashed, gnashed or ground their teeth at him. It seems to imply they're just as if they were one that bite him to pieces and eat at him and attack him and gnash him like a dog or a cat or a wild animal would just attack. And I see a lot of that in the, uh, the things surrounding Jesus at the cross as well. So David obviously speaking a little bit about that. Okay, let's go to verses, this is Psalm 35, verse 17 to 18. I like this. He says, how long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. And surely we can identify with times in our lives, have you? ever said, how long, Lord? I mean, this has gone on quite a while now. How long, O oh Lord? It's good to know that the Lord looks on, but we don't want him to just look on and on and on and on and on and on it goes. We want him to actually then, then you know, like this, see you do something as well. <laughs> I mean, it's comforting to know that the Lord looks on you, but it's even better to know that, okay, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. Of course, when Jesus was on the cross in Psalm 22, verses 12 to 13 and 16 to 18, it mentions lions, bulls. What else is mentioned there? It says there, uh, can you go to Psalm 22? And just to bring up the different things that are mentioned there, it's listed there. Psalm 22, verses 12 to 13. Uh-huh. Okay, many bulls encompass now this is Jesus. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. And thirteen open wide their they open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. So we got bulls and lions, and then in verse sixteen to eighteen <clears throat> it says, For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Obviously, this all speaks of Jesus on the cross. But David was speaking about this in Psalm 35. He says, I'm surrounded by a pack of lions. They're, they, they can't wait to tear at me and gnash at me with their teeth. Okay? And of course, when he's saying, I need you, Lord God, to rescue my, my precious life. Is your life precious to the Lord? If David knew his was pre- rescue my, me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. <clears throat> this is Psalm 35 again. I will thank you. I mean, he sees already. I'm standing there in the great congregation. Before it's ever, ever happened, I already see myself in church the following Sunday, and I'm going to be praising the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. The only thing is, when it comes to God rescuing, when does he do it? At his time or your time? It's always according to his timetable. Amen. But you can give him a nudge, I think. You can say, come on, Lord. Okay, verses 19 to 21. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes. And let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. For they do not speak peace, but 
Uh, but against those who are quiet in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. Again, it seems very much like the happenings around the cross, in, as we saw in Psalm 22. But when someone's winking the eye, you've got to watch out for people who wink, who have a reason for their winking, okay? They're winking at maybe at somebody else. This guy's a fool here. <laughs> Watch out for those guys. They, they, they could be up to something. He says, because they, they're winking the eye, they're full of deceit, and they devise words to try to hurt the, the people. Who are they, who are they ag against? They are against those who are quiet in the land. Think, ah, oh, you're e easy targets. But God, come to my defense. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully. I mean, it's different if you were guilty, but they're not guilty. And remember what he says again in verse uh, seven, it had said um, about without cause. Here again, he says, who hit me without cause. There seems to be an awful lot of that in the psalm. It'd be different, as I said, if there was a reason, but there's no cause for this. They're just out to get you for no reason, okay? Verses 22 to 25 says this, you have seen, O Lord, be not silent, O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and arouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our hearts desire. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Here David is pointing out the obvious, that the Lord sees everything, does he not? We know he sees it. You see, does he not say you have, say, you have seen, O oh Lord, I know you're watching me. You see what's going on. Don't be silent. Don't just sit there and do nothing. Okay? Do not be far from me. Do, does that remind you of anything? Do you remember what happened when Jesus was on the cross? He would have felt that he was forsaken by God. Why has he, the Father turned his back on me? What, what's going on? Well, he knew exactly what was going on. He had taken upon sin, uh, taken sin upon himself. He was being cursed in our place. And therefore, you know, he could understand that. But Jesus went through all of this. David was going through this. Be not far from me. Awake and rise yourself. It's not that God sleeps. He never slumbers nor sleeps, does he? But he can be uh, moved um, and especially when people cry out to him and like this saying, Lord, I need you to wake up. I need you to awake and rise yourself. I don't want you to be just sitting there watching. I want you to get up and do something. That might sound, does it sound a bit like, oh, bold? <laughs> but, but saying, God, I need you to do something. That's all. Don't let them have their heart's desire fulfilled. Because what are these people? They're false witnesses. As I said, if it was a true witness, that's a different story. But these are false witnesses. And here's the deal. What does God say about false witnesses? Any idea? Remember, what, you don't have to turn to all these, but Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness. One of the Ten Commandments. And another one, very important though, is Proverbs 6. You can look this one up. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, such as in this psalm, a feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Know anyone like that? <laughs> well, you may, you may have come across them in your time. Um, but here's the deal. Because there is no cause that they can find, and yet I have a reason to make a cause to pray. Okay, I have a good reason to pray. Another one, by the way, is Proverbs 12, 22, which says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. And one more, Proverbs 19, verse 5. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. So you know what? When you know the scriptures like what uh, I've just quoted there, say you knew those Proverbs, you can say, hold on a second. 
I was just praying. But I'm not going to base my prayers on the Scriptures, on the Word of God. Because you hate a false witness, because it's wrong in your eyes, Lord God, I have a good reason. I have a cause to raise this up before you, knowing that you hate it so much that you will act. Amen? They will not go unpunished. Amen? We're on our last page. This is good. Okay. Just on that last section, actually, where is it? It's, um, 22. I think I might have to grab my glasses for the Bible. Printing is a little small here. Okay. Verse 26 says, Let them be put to shame and disappointed together who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnified themselves against me. Well, we know what's going on there, don't we? We're just praying, God, bring upon them what they deserve. I don't want them to be able to rejoice over me. But let them be disappointed altogether. I mean, who would stand there and, and, and rejoice at someone else's calamity? Okay. There was one last, one phrase I, I didn't mention, and that was this. In verse 24, uh, verse 22 to 24, You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake, arise yourself for my, my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Um, and the reason why I bring it back to that is because that phrase there, my Lord, my God and my Lord, I thought, well, that sounds familiar. And it does, because it was almost word for word what uh, Thomas said when he met the risen Lord. You know what he said? My Lord and my God. And here we have, and I wonder, was it ever quoted from there? Vindicate me, O Lord, my God. That is exactly what um, a person who knows God would say. This, that there, there's only one God and there's only one Lord, and that's whom we have put our trust in. Okay, we're getting to the end here. Okay, verse 27 says, Let those who delight in my righteousness, shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Okay, so thank God that there are people who delight in my righteousness. And what it's talking about here, it's not just that, oh, it's great that you are righteous. It's the idea what did I say at the very beginning? The whole scenario was like a court scene. Have you ever seen um, a documentary or on the news where somebody has been taken to court, falsely accused, and then they're given the verdict, not guilty? What happens? Is there a rejoicing? The family is happy and they're, they're, they're thanking, um, hugging each other and all the rest of it. Well, the whole scene here is somebody who's been falsely accused, taken to court perhaps, dragged uh, into court or pursued, and he's saying, I need someone to help me. And of course, the one who's come, coming to his help is the Lord. But what is the final outcome? There is rejoicing for those who are on your side. So when he says, let those who delight in my righteousness or my vindication, a shout for joy and be glad. What's going to happen? Oh, it's wonderful that you got off there. Uh, you're not guilty. You're, allowed to, you're, you're, let to, you're let go. Is there not a greater reason to rejoice? We're a bit too quiet, aren't we, when it comes to the rejoicing aspect of things? We need to be making a lot of noise, okay? Let them, what? Shout for joy and be glad. And say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. I know there's... Uh, a lot of people like the King James Version and the New King James Version and the American Standard Bible where it says, Great is the Lord who delights in the prosperity of his servant. How many like that? They like the prosperity aspect of things. Well, prosperity is quite a broad subject, isn't it? It's not just money in your pocket. It is the well-being. And that's why it says in this uh, translation, the ESV, who delights in the welfare. God is interested in your welfare, in your well-being. Is that good? He says, I am interested in you. I want to see you doing well. I'm interested in your welfare and in everything that goes toward your prospering. Amen? Who delights in the welfare of his servants, then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. I mean, what does David see here? He sees the end result of being totally vindicated, brought out, and uh, out of say the courtroom or whatever it is, and to be rejoicing in, amongst God's people with the 
uh, surrounding with people who are praising the Lord together. Amen? That's what we ought to be. Because we have every reason as believers to be rejoicing. Have we been vindicated? Have we been let off the hook, as it were? Are we under condemnation anymore? The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I've said this a number of times. It's in the Psalms. But here's a guy who's been released from it. And that's the way we ought to be as people of God. If we knew what we were under, if we knew the warfare that was against us, if we knew the attacks that were against us, if we knew that God has actually spoken to us and said, not guilty, it takes a huge weight off your shoulders, doesn't it? Now, oh, thank God, I'm no longer being pursued by my enemies, and I rejoice and give thanks all day long. Amen? And we're going to close it there. There's so much in that psalm. And just think, that's in the Old Testament. But we can reflect upon that being having New Testament parallels, and we can say, thank God, he is interested in his people. He delights in your prosperity, in your well-being, and for your, your spiritual good, your physical good, and every department of your life. Amen. You have one who is a defender, who isn't sitting idly by watching the struggles that you go through in life and saying, hmm, I see what you're going through. <laughs> but he acts, and we thank God for that. Let's stand together, and we'll just pray. Um, because there may be people here, and we don't do an awful lot of praying, but maybe together we could cry out to the Lord for the, on behalf of those who are struggling at the moment. Father God, would you just move on the behalf of those people who are not here today because they're suffering in one way or another, if they're going through pain, sickness, uh, troubles in life, whatever they're going through, Lord God, despair, mental, physical, whatever it may be. I pray, we pray together, Lord God, uh, that you would rise up and act on their behalf. Thank you, Lord God, that you're not slumbering or sleeping. You're not slow when it comes or slack when it comes to your promises, but you fulfill your word, Lord God, and you delight in looking after your people. And we thank you, Lord God. Lord God, for the weak and those who are struggling, thank you, Lord God, right at this moment, Although you see them, and we do not see them, we do ask you, Lord God, that you would inject them with your spirit, Lord God, and empower them this moment in Jesus' name. And if there's anyone here who's here today in this congregation, we pray your spirit, Lord God, would stir them, O oh Lord God. Let your word in their soul be, I am your salvation. We thank you, Lord God, for ministering your word to us in Jesus' name. Can we do that song, I Was a Wretch? Because I, I had listed it down as a possible song. We could do. You, you, you one of your favorite songs. I was a wretch. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way. Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul And for the first time I had hope God applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the 
darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, then you walked right out again. of our day rejoicing and the rest of this week and we pray for your people as we go now Lord Jesus that you would minister to them and we would minister to others as we go and share the joy and the peace that we have through Jesus Christ to others in Jesus name Amen Amen Glory to God say hello to our visitors and don't forget to stay for probably tea or coffee and a cake